Good day, um, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Department of Politics and International Relations and the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation, which is part of the nine flagship centers of the Center of Excellence in the University of Johannesburg, and all our global partners represented today, um, the Institute of Gender and Development Studies, University of West Indies in Jamaica, the Institute of Legislative and Development Studies in Nigeria, an embassy of the Republic of Lutania to the Republic of South Africa, amongst others. It is with great pleasure and anticipation that I extend a warm welcome to every one of you to this important gathering on understanding the impact of gender-based violence on vulnerable groups at global perspectives. Your presence here today underscores your commitment to addressing one of the most pressing and pervasive challenges facing our societies today, worldwide. Gender-based violence knows no boundaries. It transcends borders, cultures, and social economic status affecting individuals in every corner of the globe. However, its impact is often disproportionately felt by those already vulnerable and marginalized within the communities. Today, we have come together to dwell into this critical issue and explore its multifaceted dimensions from a global perspective. We recognize that vulnerable groups, including women, children, the LGBTQ plus individuals, persons with disabilities and refugees, amongst others, are often at heightened risk of experiencing GBV in its various forms. Our discussions will not only shed light on the prevalence and patterns of GBV, but also dwell into its profound and far-reaching consequences on the lives of survivors and the communities they belong to. We will explore the intersecting factors that excavate vulnerability to GBV, such as poverty, inequality, discrimination, and lack of access to essential services. Furthermore, we'll be examining promising practices and interventions from around the world aimed at preventing and addressing GBV, as well as supporting survivors on their path to healing and recovery. By sharing knowledge and experiences and insights, we aim to foster greater understanding and collaboration in our collective efforts to combat GBV and promote gender equality and social justice for all. As we embark on this journey of learning and dialogue, I encourage each of you to approach our discussions with an open mind and a compassionate heart. Let us listen attentively to the voices of survivors and advocate drawing inspiration from their resilience and determination in the face of adversity. Together, we have the power to make a difference let us harness our collective strength and solidarity to create a world where every individual, regardless of their gender or background, can live free from the fear of violence and oppression. My name is uh, Professor Tino Adeojo. I'm the head unit of Pan-African Women's Studies Unit at the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation and also an associate professor at the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Johannesburg. Once again, I extend my heartfelt welcome to all participants and I look forward to the enlightening and enriching discussions that lie ahead. Thank you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleague here today, Professor Dana Fox, the Regional Director of the Institute of Gender and Development Studies at the University of West Indies, Jamaica, to take over to introduce the panel, the panelists, and actually kickstart the first panel session for us. Thank you very much, everyone. Hope you enjoy the section. Um, Dana will be giving instructions. Uh, we encourage everyone to uh, put their comments on the chat box and also the Q&A session so that we can take your questions as we embark on this journey. Thank you so much. Dana, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ojo. 
It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here today, even while we speak about such an important and pressing issue. Let me begin with some general opening remarks that will lead into our first three speakers. Following those three speakers, we will have an opportunity for question and answers, and then we will move into the second part of our webinar today, the next three speakers and another Q&A. As Dr. Ojo has stated, gender-based violence remains a pervasive issue worldwide, affecting individuals across various demographic groups. The impact of gender-based violence is often exacerbated for vulnerable groups. Moreover, despite the inclusion of equality for women in international human rights frameworks since the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, known as the CEDAW, and the development of international and national legal mechanisms for the equality of women to protect migrant rights, the rights of persons with disabilities, LGBTQI plus persons, and other vulnerable groups, we see a world that remains significantly unequal and unsafe. And this even in the wealthiest countries of the world. As I only learned myself yesterday, in the CEDAW, the issue of violence against women and girls was only raised in the mid 1980s. And after decades of struggle for inclusion, we see ongoing organized movements to push back on rights gained, to erase hard won rights, even while many legislative agendas remain unimplemented with too many governments lacking the political will or financing to appropriate adequate resources to allow the legal machinery to protect vulnerable groups. The laws must be developed further, implemented and monitored. The need for education beginning early on, combined with community dialogues, pressure from legal practitioners and activists are critical in pressuring governments to implement existing laws strengthen social services, their delivery and access to them, and to develop comprehensive approaches to GBV. We know a lot. There are many people across all these sectors from civil society, academia, policy, the business world, where sexual harassment policies have increasingly been deployed, legislative arenas, and of course, we cannot forget the ex lived experiences of individuals, the most important, who are victim survivors of GBV. Their knowledge and solutions are foundational to all interventions. It's the responsibility of all of us, including scholar activists, to amass these vast insights, this corpus of knowledge, to respond to specific local contexts and broadly shared conditions that impact the incidences and nature of GBV, such as interlocking global systemic inequalities from capitalist extractive industries to the military industrial uh, complex, as well as climate crisis and the complicity of fossil fuel corporations, fueling migration, generating massive waves of refugees that will only continue Climate emergencies are leading to greater food insecurity for women and girls as traditional procurers of food and thus increased violence. Unpaid care work is also increasing. Women are disproportionately represented in low wage sectors. These precarities carry, and I'm sorry, these precarities are exacerbated for the disabled, gender and sexual minorities, the elderly, children, religious and ethnic minorities, and carry the greatest significant impact of GBV, which encompasses various forms of violence, physical, sexual, emotional, and economic abuse rooted in unequal power dynamics among genders, men, women, men, and gender non-conforming persons. 
vulnerable groups face intersecting forms of discrimination and marginalization, intensifying their vulnerability to GBV. Cultural norms, beliefs, and practices, socioeconomic disparities, inadequate legal protection, and systemic inequalities compound the changes faced by these groups. Given these two prongs, our wealth of knowledge and the depth of the problem, our focus today will, to be, will be to examine the unique manifestations of GBV expressed by vulnerable groups worldwide. We also hope that the presentations today and in part two of a webinar coming later will be woven into an edited volume. Now we will move on to the first three speakers whom I have the pleasure of introducing. And I would like to remind you to please put your questions in the chat and to prepare questions for the first part of the Q&A following our presenters. We begin today with Dr. Lee Emily Hakibi, who is a research fellow and head of the Gender and Inclusivity Unit at the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies, the think tank and capacity building arm of Nigeria's National Assembly. In her current role as head of GIU, she conducts research on socioeconomic and political issues and provides recommendations to members and relevant committees of the National Assembly. Emily holds a doctorate in development finance from the University of Stellenbosch, South Africa, and has researched the energy sector, gender issues, public finance, agriculture, and youth policies in recent years. She has acquired training and developed competencies in computable gen general equilibrium modeling, macro econometric modeling, you can tell that's not my expertise, um, public sector government, and, and budgetary reforms and gender analysis and economic policy research. Let's welcome Dr. Emily, after which we will move on to our second panelist. Thank you very much, Diane. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me just quickly try and share my screen. Yeah, um, can you, Dan, can you confirm if you can see my screen? Yes, I can see it. All right. Just like uh, Diane has introduced, um, my name is Emily Ihide. I'm the head of Gender and Inclusivity Unit at the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies. Today, I will be speaking on uh, briefly on a study that we started in the unit on gender-based violence in Nigeria. So, um, of course, uh, just like they have explained or um, um, just like they have explained, um, this is a process um, that is going to take, we're just starting, it's just, we're just at the desk review process. Um, it's going to involve a lot of work in terms of field work, we're going to go deep into this issue, um, looking at the perspective, public perspective of uh, gender-based violence in Nigeria. We're going to look at the prevalence and the legal framework, but today I'm just quickly going to, because I have, I think, 10 minutes, I'm quickly going to speak briefly on the prevalence and the legal framework that is in existence in Nigeria. Um, so um, I'm going to go through, I would give a bit of introduction, uh, talk a little bit of the issues of GBV in Nigeria, and then what are the causes of the increase that we're seeing currently on GBV, and then the legal framework, what is in existence? Do we have gaps as far as the legal framework for combating GBV uh, in Nigeria is concerned, and then a bit, a bit of recomm uh, uh, recommendations that we can, that we intend to actually continue to work on. 
So just like they have said, gender-based violence remains a social and a, a public health issue, and it's a major cause and effect of gender um, equality. Now, it's a global phenomenon, but it has country-specific. When we're talking about gender-based violence, it's an issue that is global, but then individual countries have factors that probably have worked against or helped to increase the, the issue of uh, gender-based violence, just like we have seen in, in Nigeria. It cut across both genders, uh, even though um, evidence have shown that uh, women, sorry, women uh, tend to be more involved when it comes to gender-based uh, violence issues. Nonetheless, we have women that are more often not usually at the, who are usually at the receiving end of violence, which consequently now has led to contribute to the issues of gender inequalities. Uh, if we look at it, it has uh, different dimensions. We can it can be physical, uh, just a bit a bit of background. We can be talking about sexual and psychological. Uh, uh, economical uh, areas of gender-based violence. And then we, when, we, when we break it down, what, what are the effects of gender-based violence or how does it manifest? Manifest. We usually we see it comes in the form of beating, rape, humiliation, uh, verbal abuse, uh, widowhood in some uh, cultural uh, area, in some regions, we have widows that are being abused in terms of cultural practices. And then we have also in some part of Nigeria, the issues of any marriages and harassment and female genital uh, mutilation of the issues that are seen as uh, gender-based violence that occurs in different parts of the country. So usually what are the consequences of GBV? Uh, we see them it's in forms of depression, suicide, murder, uh, sexually transmitted diseases and physical injuries. And sometimes in most cases, as we are currently be recording, we find the issues, the cases of death that are reported. This makes the issue of GBV a global concern requiring concerted effort of all and to end it to protect the valuable lives of our women and girls, and I would say also the boy child as well in this regard. So in the case of Nigeria, we have seen data over the years. Um, we have seen escalation in the figures, particularly due to the insurgencies in some parts of the country. Um, we have also seen data that have shown that in the reported cases, cases of sexual violence have increased over time. So it's from, we see that between 2015 and 2019, and between 2020 and now, there has been major increase in the cases of gender-based violence that have been recorded uh, nationally, even at state level. And then we also reports have shown that mo majorly of major um, most of these cases reported about 31 percent of adult women, which falls between 15 and 49, have experienced physical violence in Nigeria. And we also have evidence that have shown that between January 2020 and July 2022, we recorded um, 7,000 incidents of GBV were recorded according to the UN uh, report. Then let me just quickly run through, but recently, the data that has been showed by the Ministry of Women Affairs, we see that, um, this thing is blocking my, we see that, um, sorry, we see that uh, the cases being reported in Nigeria, we have about 40,000 cases that has been reported between 2020 and 2020, first quarter of 2024. So there has been drastic increase compared to the years, what we had between 2020, 2015 and 2019 and between 2020 and 2024. Now the issues are what are the 
causes or factors that are um, contributing to the issues, um, the cases of gender-based violence that are being recorded now. Now, if we look at it, um, look at the causes that we have been able to outline, if we look at it, are we not going to be thinking of, okay, just like the reports have shown, we have seen the cases of insurgency, cases of economic issues, poverty level, hunger, and of course we have the issues of culture and, um, and religion. Now, this makes it very uh, concerning in the case of Nigeria because the issues of GBV also varies across region in Nigeria. Now, if you look at um, states where we have insurgency, then we can easily explain the issue, the rise in GBV. But then some of the reports that we have also seen, for example, in the southeast of Nigeria, we saw some states that have also reported high increase in cases reported uh, on GBV. So this research actually is just um, looking at what the factors that are causing the increase and looking at the legal frameworks that we have to resolve some of these issues and what can be done henceforth. How, how do we, what, how, what, what can we, can we do in terms of research to inform policies to tackle the issues of GBV in Nigeria? So just like I've stated, uh, I think the rationale people have explained reports in the literature, it has been explained that the causes, one of the major reasons for the increase in GBV in Nigeria could be uh, due to some of the insecurity issues that, has, uh, that arose over time in the past decade uh, the insurgencies in the Northeast. And, um, and then we also, it's also explained by culture, the cultural, the cultural pers perceptions. We talk about poverty, we talk about hunger, we talk about substance abuse. These all fall under some economic issues that are challenges that are currently facing the country. And then the gaps in the legal framework that protect uh, vulnerable persons in Nigeria. So I'm um, just the legal frameworks that we have that exist. We have the constitution. Uh, we have the child right law. We have the Violence Against Persons uh, uh, Prohibition Act, and then among all that, the international um, protocols that we also have. We have, we have signed onto the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination I'm Against Women. Sorry, Dr. Emily. I'm sorry, Dr. Emily. We're not seeing your slides. The slides are stuck on the first one. Could you possibly uh, uh, start the slideshow because we're only seeing the first slide? Oh, really? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I think that, that's I was... okay. If you if you go to start, you know, stop slideshow from current slide. Yep, I'm trying. Sorry to, to interrupt. Thank you. Yeah, but I'm just trying to. Oh shoot! Slideshow. It's okay. It's okay. We're hearing you clearly. Okay, Tino, can you help me share? Because I'm um, because I'm trying to. You can just continue. The project team will project it for you. Okay. All right. Hi, Dr. Emily. Can you just kindly let me know which slide you are on, and I will go there for you. Can you go to slide five? I think I'm out. Sure, no problem. Yeah, so I'll go to six now. I think I was already on six. Yeah, so I was talking about the legal frameworks that exist in Nigeria uh, in terms of uh, that uh, talk on the regular and the prevention of GBV. So we had the um, constitution uh, make provision for discrimination based on gender, religion, ethnicity, age, etc. We have the Child Rights uh, Act, because of my time, we have the Violence Against Persons uh, Prohibition Act 2015. Please, can you kindly just help me run through this? Yeah, and then we also have the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Just go to the next slide, because... Um, I just wanted to point that out. So gaps in the legal framework in Nigeria that we have been able to uh, just identify, we know that uh, even though the Child Rights Act 
and the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act of 2015 uh, have been passed at the federal government level, but not by many of the states. This is one issue because um, the way the Nigerian um, structure is, we have a federal and we have the sub um, national, the states. So the law, it has been passed at the federal level, but at the state level, the sub national, not all the states have passed this law. So that's an issue, that's a gap, actually, when it comes to the legal, uh, the legal framework. Uh, for GBV in Nigeria. Then we also have that, the legis even though the legislation have um, largely tried to address some of the social cultural factors breeding GBV, such as uh, patriarchal, religion, and traditional uh, belief of the position of women in the society, it has however largely failed in addressing the economic status of women in terms of their poverty and literacy, illiteracy levels. So, um, and then we also talked about the lack of legal protection and implementation of an effective redress mechanisms in the laws for GBV. And then another thing that we have also identified is the knowledge gap, lack of public awareness. So what we're trying to say here is, of course, maybe that we even have the laws, but these laws, how many people are actually aware of the laws? How many people can uh, actually come out to talk about um, any form of abuse? So when we're looking at the prevalence of GBV in Nigeria, comparing with, we say there is a rise in the, in the prevalence of GBV in Nigeria, what are the factors that we're looking at? Are we looking at um, the, fact, the fact that the in the, in the time of 2015, maybe probably some of these data were not well captured. Or are we also talking about, okay, now maybe because more people are coming out to talk about the issues of GBV, maybe that we have more of some sort of awareness. Could that be the reason why now we're seeing more of an increase in GBV in Nigeria? Or could it be the laws that have now been amended to address some of these issues? has cultural perceptions and uh, religion aspect been dealt with? What could be responsible for the rise in the, in the gender-based violence in Nigeria and all the crises in terms of uh, physical abuse, emotions, what could be attributing to the rise that has been seen in, in, in the case of Nigeria? So these are some of the issues that we intend to actually delve into. Uh, when we get to the time of doing the field work, we would we intend to engage with institutions that are responsible for GBV in Nigeria. We intend to go to the field and interact with persons, survivors of GBV. We intend to be able to meet with CSOs and international organizations. We intend to meet with the public to know the public perceptions when it comes to GBV in Nigeria. So. Uh, can you move to the next stage, please? Yes, so just to conclude, um, we've looked at it and the desk review that has been done, there's a lot of work that we need to do. So some of the things that we intend to do henceforth is to have a general review of the legislative measures and policy initiatives in Nigeria, look at the constitutions, look at the laws, the legislations on GBV and see, identify the gaps and relate with the institutions, engage with institutions that are involved in GBV uh, in Nigeria. There's also a need to intensify public, public uh, sensitization when it comes to GBV awareness creation programs yeah, I, I'm, I'm done. This is the last slide. And then we also, I look, we also have to look at the level of economic empowerment, the impact of economic empowerment when it comes to GBV, because there's also one, there's also a theory that even with economic empowerment comes the issue of gender-based violence in a system where we have the patriarchal uh, system, when women are getting more empowered, Power. It means they are more enlightened. It means they are getting more earnings. It means they are able to stand on their own. So how is that being seen by the male counterpart? And what is the reaction is being empowered? How is it reflecting? How does it affect gender-based violence? How does it contribute to gender-based violence? And also, we also want to look at some of the supports that are a system that have been 
are made available in the country for GBV survivors, and also look at how the Ministry of Women Affairs is co coordinating some of these activities that has to do with GBV in Nigeria. So the next step will be for us to be able to put all this together. I think in the next. Uh, um, in the next uh, virtual meeting, we'll have more information as far as Nigeria is concerned. Thank you all for listening. Uh, over to you, Dan. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ehinde, for this very powerful um, overview of the range of challenges that are faced in Nigeria and the questions that you have uh, concluded with that I hope we can get into a little bit more in the Q&A. Why is there a rise of violence in certain spaces? What are public perceptions? Um, what is the relationship between women's empowerment and GBV uh, and the like? As I had said, there's a lot we know, but there's a lot we don't know. Um, and so hopefully we will turn to uh, the ways in which we can get at these uh, still pressing questions. I now move on to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Felicia Nkomo. Ms. Nkomo is a development economist. She has eight years of work experience as an economic policy advisor in the public sector with combined exposure in civil society organizations, legislative development, and grant-making organizations for nine years. Ms. Nkomo holds an honors degree in economics and is currently pursuing a master's in development finance at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. Ms. Felicia, over to you. Am I audible? Yes, you are. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, hosting this webinar and uh, thank you to, uh, to Dr. Ikito who spoke earlier. I'm really not going to be outlining the context in relation to South Africa because I think it's very similar to Nigeria. But of course, I cannot miss this opportunity to really honor the feminist of South Africa gender justice activist uh, and as well as civil society organizations who've really worked hard in the last six years, not only to advocate for um, recognition of gender-based violence as part of the political agenda, but also to make it sure that it's not, it's also resourced and that there are clear regulations that supports uh, um, the interventions. And, and as such, the, 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 the gender-based violence in South Africa had received high level attention and as far as the president. As we speak today, which I'm going to really spend, you know, the next 10 to 15 minutes outlining the, the NSP on gender-based violence, uh, its theory of change, the principles that are under, underlines the implementation, but as well as the pillars that really seeks to ensure that we deal with uh, gender-based violence. And I do want to say that I think the theory of change is actually quite simple. Firstly, it recognizes that uh, we need to take an intersectional approach in how we deal with gender-based violence. And then the second one is that we need to invest in public education and conversations starting from families, households. Uh, but also the third one is that we're not going to deal with gender-based violence without taking on a multi-sectoral approach in society where we both involve civil society organizations, government, private sector, and as such, as a result of that multi-sectoral and collective thinking within the national context, it led to the establishment of gender-based response um, fund, which is a pool of, uh, in, of funds that have been put together by private sector to deal with gender-based uh, uh, violence. So in essence, under the theme, which I, uh, I was really asked to speak to on what's the approach, and I do think that uh, speaking after the uh, Professor Ikita from Nigeria, who are still undertaking research, I think there are several lessons that they could learn from how South Africa has, 
has actually uh, dealt with uh, gender-based violence. And I'm saying that knowing with a caveat that there are several strengths within the systems system, also there are still uh, weaknesses. Because sometimes when you want to deal with a, a social crisis within a neoliberal pu public governance system, you're always likely to hit several snags, including as well as constraints in the system because the neoliberal system is really not designed to deal with issues around social crisis, but it's of always around, you know, individualism, but also it promotes individualism and as well as a maximization of profits. So, and then coming back into the principles that underlined the national strategy um, uh, on um, uh, gender-based violence in South Africa. There are 10 principles. I'm really going to highlight it. I mean, the first one, um, is around multisectoralism, which I've already outlined, that there was a clear recognition. I'm, I'm happy to share my presentation um, a little later because uh, I had to step in for a colleague who could who was not available to speak. So uh, my notes are kind of like handwritten, but I will share the notes later. Um, so, the so the first one, as I said, is multisectoralism, which really recognizes that, you know, all parties, faith-based organizations, civil society organizations, traditional leaders, youth movements, et cetera, are critical in dealing with gender-based violence. Because in essence, if you're dealing with a system that is embedded in social construction, in the cultural system, but also that gets reinforced by patriarchal system and economic system, you therefore need all hands in the deck. So you need, but also fundamentally, you need a political commitment. And in this context, I think South African government has shown that political commitment. But then the second principle that it recognizes is complementing augmenting existing strategies. One of the key things that we this second principle underlines is that there's always there's always work that has been done around gender-based ones, but also there are generations, uh, you know, who of feminists who've really been pursuing work and uh, and addressing issues in that different in that specific context. And there's always going to be leveraging opportunities. So, so therefore the NSP is not being introduced with the intention of erasing the work of the previous generation. But in fact it's intended at building and making sure that it involves everybody else. The other one it's around active and meaningful participation is the mobilization. So is that and it's a recognition that gender-based violence will not be will not be eradicated in society without an active and meaningful participation, particularly of communities. And that and that meaningful has to be really about the personal transformation, the family transformation, but also the deeper understanding around gender-based violence at, at, at community level. The fourth one is to really look at gender responsive transformative approaches that takes into account what uh, 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 Dr. Cox, has, uh, Cox has, uh, in her opening remarks has highlighted as structural inequalities, right? And then gender differentiation, but also intersectionality. And that we should not treat gender-based violence uh, and femicide from a premise of homogeneity in that we must actually look at different things. And I think this is deep feminist and intersectional theory that is very rich, that will be able to allow us to help better understand this. And then the other principle is to is, is really around a human rights based and um, survivor centered and uh, and focused approaches where people if they have experienced gender based violence they need to be treated with dignity and they have, they have, instead of being subjected into some form of both social and cultural judgment and of course one of the other principles that is quite important is really recognizing intergenerational conversations because in essence, all of us, by the way, are products of a patriarchal system and we're unlearning so many things. And it's important that as we continue to unlearn, but also there's, there's an intergenerational conversation that ensures that everyone else is brought on board and that for future, we're able to see a society that is actually transformed. The seventh one is progressive realization. Is to under, and, and I think this principle sits one of the key things it's around, it looks at a prioritization of reforms. And um, Dr. Aikita speaks about the regulation regimes. So when you talk, when you're dealing with gender-based violence, one of the priorities around changing the regulations and as well uh, regulations or introducing reforms that facilitate actually a uh, transformation 
in in in, in institutions that are on the front line or that are holders of uh, rights in this context which will be your 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 police system your judicial system for instance the case management uh, related uh, issues uh, because those are actually institutions that the survivors and victims would actually really be interfacing with and that prioritization of reforms and we've seen that coming through since the passing of the NSP. The other one is really around the forward looking and in the co-creation. Part of it is to recognize, I think along the lines of non-homogeneity, is to recognize that it's important to work with people who may be sitting with new ideas, but also that because you've been working in the space of gender-based violence and femicide, you're not sitting with a repository of knowledge and that there needs to be a co-creation in the thinking. I mean, the other one, it's around mutual accountability for change. Now, obviously, in a multi-sectoral space, there could be a lot of mixed messages, but also accountability needs to actually hold. It's one of the anchors that holds this conversation, but also this transformative, social transformation work, because at the heart of it is that we need to know what's the contribution of civil society organization, private sector government, families, and communities. Um, and, and that accountability helps us to also um, use the yardstick to assess the progress that we're making in relation to meeting the, uh, uh, the, the theory of change um, that we've actually set for ourselves. And the last one, it's around inclusiveness, embracing diversity and intersectionality. And, and, and this principle, it's about recognizing the importance of centering the experience of women more marginalized by poverty, race, age, gender, disability, sexual orientation, gender, identity, and, uh, and, and nationality. And we know that this is really, most of us were in a, a, in a growing phase or growing journey in relation to actually ensuring that we're more inclusive, we embrace diversity and inter intersectionality. And you can imagine that in a, in a multi-sectoral approach, where, for example, you involve in faith-based organizations who sometimes may feel that actually they have no recognition of LGBT to apply plus uh, 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 gendered identity. And that gene, it means that those who are feminist gender justice activists in this place, in this space, their role is to continue to patiently educate and hold because transformation of society will not happen when we still continue to marginalize certain groups. And in the last part of my presentation, uh, Dr. Koss is really going to be taking about six minutes. So what then we've then designed, we've designed six pillars that really underpins this principle and the theory of change that I've highlighted earlier. And in the first one is around accountability and coordination and leadership. And this one really sits within the point I was making on, on political accountability and centering gender-based violence and femicide within political party agenda. In fact, one of the things I could mention that as a result of the establishment and the work of the feminist gender justice activists of South Africa, political parties now, as we approach the elections in the next 80 days in South Africa, they all know that none of them would interface with citizens without clearly articulating what would be their response in gender-based violence. And I think for me, that's one of the greatest um, achievements um, at a political level, obviously you then need to start starting to segment and say which other areas were. So amongst those, this leadership and accountability, where in fact, in this context, the president has actually established, is actually, you know, through the office, is actually leading this process. I chair one of the pillars, which I'll speak a lot more on it, on economic power. So there's a lot more reporting that takes place in, in, the, in the government. And of course, there's still weaknesses because at a national level, Multisectoralism is working very neatly, but also we struggle when you go into um, at a at a local level. The next pillar is prevention and rebuilding social cohesion. It's a, really about the the cure of social change around public education, ensuring that the complex conversations of patriarchy and social construction takes place at local level. It's justice, safety, and protection. It's the legislative reform I was talking about, but also fundamentally sensitizing a judicial system um, in, in terms of taking on a human rights approach in dealing with survivors and victims of gender-based violence. Response care, um, support and healing. And in the healing for me, often 
is one of the most important things. I mean, knowing that South Africa has a history, in fact, even I suppose Africa has a history of violence. Eh? And normally it actually manifests itself in gender-based violence. And what often would happen is that you see a lot of toxic masculinity emerging in societies that have experienced both colonialism, but as well as um, a, a political violence. And the healing component is important in that we recognize that you never build social cohesion and stable society and families if you, you don't include healing. I think economic power, one of the key issues here we recognize is that structural exclusion, in fact, is part of economic violence, but also sometimes the inclusion that is often um, uh, um, uh, focused in the short term where women are included in on paper in terms of legislation or those who are who are vulnerable but also they are not fully included so economic power is really one of the pillars that really looks at what type of structural structural exclusion and inequality that we're experiencing and how to make sure that we facilitate participation of women and and marginalized in in the economy and that they don't remain in violent uh, relationship. The last one is the research and development. I think this one is really intended at recognizing that in fact, society evolves and therefore research and development is important to consistently um, fit into what is the new discourse that we're dealing with and the new generation of uh, 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 forms of new um, gender-based violence and we need to be able to invest in R&D so that we're not caught off guard in our own uh, interventions. With those words, thank you so much, Dr. Cox, and thank you to the, um, to the participants. Thank you so very much for that really powerful and inspiring presentation laying out this theory of change and the six pillars. I'm sure there will be many questions. Um, I certainly have some about its implementation. Let us now move on to our third presentation. And just as a reminder uh, to our audience, uh, after this third presentation, we will have an opportunity for Q&A. We have a number of questions and comments already um, that I am compiling. So let us now introduce Ms. Rugule Utkevichuda, who is a gender equality and gender-based violence prevention expert and co-founder and CEO of, NG of the NGO Ribologia. Sorry if I mispronounced this, Ribologia. You, you will pronounce it for us. <laughs> um, which is the only NGO in Lithuania working solely on prevention of sexual violence. Wow. Mugile has been providing free legal aid for victims of different forms of gender-based violence, from domestic violence to human trafficking. She is a co-author of a book titled Pascui Ribas on sexual violence prevention in early childhood education. That is wonderful, as we've been talking about these interventions early on in education. In 2021, Mugile was awarded the National Equality and Diversity Award for creating the platform www 9 IT on prevention of GBV among youth. Congratulations and over to you, Rugile. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Diana, uh, for the presentation and your Lithuanian uh, skills are actually uh, great. <laughs> Lithuanian is one of the you know it's really tough language so thank you for uh for doing it uh great um okay so i will share a little bit of our experience and the impact of gbv to vulnerable uh, groups i will point out uh, different problems and solutions uh, that we have in lithuania but first i wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about lithuania so we are a country located in northern europe we have uh, 2.8 a million of people. We do have the same time as in South Africa, you know, that was a finding I found out yesterday, which is great. And we love our freedom so much that we have and celebrate two Independence Day, we cannot get enough. Um, one fun fact is our women gained the right to vote in 1918, which we are very uh, proud of. And we are a country of uh, resilient women. Um, and uh, 
other similarities uh, than time, every third woman in Lithuania have experienced some form of GBV. So it doesn't matter which country I go, uh, the statistics are usually uh, the same. So we have it in Lithuania. Uh, in Lithuania, our approach uh, from activists for a long, long, many, many years was that uh, we want to tackle gender inequality because we see gender inequality as the main cause and consequence of gender-based violence. So we cannot stress enough how important it is to tackle gender inequality. So we are saying that in all stakeholders meetings that we have, especially with different political parties, parliament, uh, government uh, entities, and so on and so forth, you know, because if you do not know uh, what you want to prevent and the main reasons uh, for, for that, you will spend your money not in the right way. Uh, therefore, I'm happy that Lithuania was rated number nine in the world on Global Gender uh, Gap Report, which really highlights uh, the efforts of our country towards uh, being a more gender equal country, although we still have some work to do. So in Lithuania and in European Union in general, we have uh, European Institute for Gender Equality. It's based in my city, in capital city Vilnius. And actually, it has this wonderful resource, which is Gender Equality Index. So you can see Gender Equality Index 100% uh, is total gender equality. And we ca you can see how Lithuania is doing. So we still have quite a long, uh, quite a long way. And they're measuring uh, this index uh, according to different, uh, different data. So you can see violence is also there, but it's more like a subdomain because it's really hard to uh, somehow compare data among different EU member states, particularly on violence. But we have other, other domains that are, I'm sure, as you know, are very much connected with the GBV issue, uh, issue as well. Uh, so that was the good side what flaws do we have? Uh, so one of the flaws that we are facing right now is failing to ratify Istanbul Convention, which is by far the most comprehensive network to prevent and address uh, violence against women and girls. So we are still battling it a lot uh, in our conversations uh, here in this country. And also quite high rates of femicide. Not Compared globally, but uh, in EU, we do have this uh, problem uh, problem a lot, and I think we share uh, we share that one for sure. Uh, today, previous speakers, I was also very inspired by your uh, by your talks. Recognize a lot of similar uh, issues, which again, you know, either we are far away, are very close to each other, are similar. So I want to focus more on sexual violence and effects it has uh, to vulnerable groups because that's the topic I work with most at the moment. Um, and sexual violence, we see a little bit of Cinderella sister of domestic violence families. So in Lithuania, we did excellent work with domestic violence, with physical violence. Now we are talking more and more about psychological violence, but sexual violence uh, for many years remained like, you know, in the backside. And now the past two years, we're really focusing on this particular form of, uh, of violence. So what the situation is, so 77% of Lithuanians uh, say they experience uh, sexual harassment at one point uh, of, uh, of their lives. And 50% uh, experience other forms of sexual violence, not including a rape. This was research done by uh, two uh, students and their professor, and they managed to do research with 1,800 uh, participants, which was amazing. And we didn't have this uh, specific data on sexual violence. So I'm very happy that they did that. And I'm, you know, ready to promote it whenever I can. Uh, in European Union, one in 10 women since the age of uh, 15 experience some form of sexual violence and one in 20 were raped. So the problem is really prevalent. The main issue that we are dealing with is also rape culture. So we see and we're trying to do uh, campaigns that uh, tackle harmful attitudes towards uh, sexual violence and change this rape culture that we have, you know, in many countries, also in Lithuania, to community culture and community support culture. You know, we want to invest uh, not only in supporting victims, which is very high on the agenda, but also to 
educate bystanders to actually stand together with victims and not do the victim blaming part. Um, and that's been a struggle, so, but an interesting, interesting work as well. As for the, uh, sexual violence, the main risk factor is, of course, gender. And if we look at gender, what do we look into that? Women, of course, it's women, but women are not a homogenous group, right? So we had to learn it the hard, the hard way because we started with women as women, and now we are looking into different groups of women that maybe you know because of uh, age, uh, religion, and all the other factors, sexual orientation that can be uh, more vulnerable than other women. So I want to just uh, check out a few group, vulnerable groups that we are working with at the moment. We'll start with women uh, with disabilities. So in Lithuania, we have Lithuanian Disability Forum organization that works as an umbrella organization, uh, and they are doing uh, a lot of research. And part of the research is on gender-based violence against women with disabilities and also sexual violence. And the amounts they experience is actually uh, pretty, uh, pretty crazy. So I have the latest data in Lithuania every other woman in disability uh, that is victim of domestic violence also said that uh, she is a victim of sexual violence. And one in four said that uh, they are experiencing sexual violence from their intimate partner often, you know, and we, we know what uh, it can do to your mind and your uh, and your mental uh, mental health, and uh, they are silenced due to you know neglect uh, because we don't talk about women with disability that much. We don't know how to react, so we just choose to be uh, silent. And some problems that we have with women and disabilities and sexual violence is that uh, they are really dependent on their intimate partner a lot and other family members. So it's actually much easier to control them. And um, in the research, they were, uh, you know, doing these interviews with women and they were saying like, okay, so if I uh, quit this uh, abusive relationship, who would take care of me? You know, I cannot live by myself. I don't want to go in some kind of facility. You know, I want to stay in my house and that's the top priority for me. So if I need to be in this abusive relationship just to have someone to take care of me, I will do that. And this is a big, uh, big issue that we are dealing uh, with right now. Also, we talk about sexual violence and women with psychosocial disability, right? They're often viewed as children, you know, so you just stay here. Maybe you have some toys around you. And we are not talking that these women uh, also, you know, uh, experience different forms of sexuality and that they also may be, uh, may be abused. And the big uh, problem is also lack of specialists working with women um, with disabilities, uh, they don't know really how to talk about sexual violence. And actually we have this problem also with experts that even work with the victims of domestic violence. You know, if you talk about sexual violence, unfortunately, but also quite normally, not all experts supporting victims of like domestic violence and other forms of uh, gender-based violence can work with victims of sexual violence or can openly talk about sex, sexuality, body, uh, uh, and things like that. Solutions. Uh, we do have specialized support for women with hearing disability, women victims of uh, sexual violence and domestic violence. In Lithuania, we have specialized assistance centers that are run by women, mostly by women NGOs, which is the achievement we are very much uh, proud of because you have NGO and activists of GBV supporting victims or survivors, which is great. Uh, we also uh, invest in research, uh, do specialized training, and also public campaigns to make women with disabilities and their problems visible. I also want to talk about two other groups. So uh, another group is women in prostitution. So we still have this uh, you know, we will support the ones that we think uh, are worth it. And women in prostitution as victims of GBV, because women in prostitution, the amount of, uh, you know, violence they experience and what does it, it does to your mental health, it's the same as, uh, you know, people being at war or being veterans at war. So it's quite terrible. And we leave them behind, actually. 
uh, very oftenly. We have high rates of uh, victim blaming, impunity of pimps and men buying women and girls. Uh, in Lithuania, by the way, prostitution is illegal. It's illegal to do that. It's illegal to buy it. But somehow we usually just uh, punish the woman, not uh, not of the buyers. And if you are a woman, a refugee woman, that you may be in fear of deportation, you know, or have la lack of trust uh, for institutions and community. How we solve that, we have the Lithuanian Coalition Without Prostitution, and I really encourage you to uh, visit Abolitionism Museum, which we uh, developed with partners and that has stories of survivors, causes, and it's very interactive, and it's in English, in Lithuanian and in English. English language. So in this sense, we're trying to build awareness about, you know, struggles that uh, women in prostitution, victims of GBV and sexual violence face. Women refugees. Uh, we are uh, supporting women re refugees uh, that suffer from sexual violence. And this is the quote from one of my clients. I was providing legal consultations. I fled my country not only because of war, but also because of my abusive husband, right? Um, because the uh, brutal, brutal Russia's war against Ukraine, we have a lot of uh, uh, refugees, uh, Ukrainian women refugees, uh, that is saying rape was used as a weapon of war. And this actually, the, the image that you see is the Olympic swimmer, world famous swimmer, Ruta Milotita, just swimming in the lake uh, near the Russian embassy in Lithuania, representing, you know, all uh, that was suffered by Ukrainian uh, people. So the problems that uh, women refugees have, lack of trust in public institutions that was formed at their home, home country usually, because in Lithuania we have quite, uh, you know, quite uh, stable police officers and people are trusting in our law enforcement a lot. Uh, lack of knowledge uh, on the legal base of what will happen to me, lack of time to get support, because you may be a victim of... Uh, uh, sexual violence that you experience uh, during war, but if you come to a new country, especially if you're a single mother, you just don't have time to go and take care of yourself and your needs as a survivor. It's like in a, the 50th plan, not the first plan that you have, and also lack of availability to recognize that behavior of gender-based violence. So we have women refugees are saying that so it happened to other women. So I was kind of expecting it will happen to me. This is like part of the deal of the whole, for example, migration or refugee process. And solution is uh, we have, again, specialized support support for uh, refugee women, a lot of emphasis of supporting uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians coming uh, and uh, fleeing Russia's war. Uh, creative workshops. Uh, from uh, my experience, I've been doing this work for 15 plus years. Nobody wants to be seen as victim in need, especially if we talk mom women groups. They don't want to go to see the seminar on sexual violence and forms, etc. They just want to go and reconnect with community or become a part of community. Talk about anything but, you know, so we are having organizations that do these creative workshops for women where they really can connect amongst each other, mingle, and then talk about issues so that they have and have the support network. And uh, yeah, support for freedom. And uh, a couple of uh, more examples, and then I will conclude. We have this uh, webpage, which is in Lithuanian, but if you press Google plugin, you can definitely read it in English uh, language as well. So if you're a victim of sexual violence in Lithuania, we have one number and you can call this number or just write a chat and then you will get support, you know, or direction to different resources that we have in Lithuania. And we have much more uh, information about, you know, uh, how to self-help yourself, how to help others, what to do if you're a bystander, what happens if you, uh, you know, experience sexual violence now or at this month, or what happens if you experience it 25 years ago, because you can still, you know, it's still a relevant issue. And the system of support I mentioned, we have very good specialized law against violence in the private area. Uh, and uh, because previous presenters, they said uh, that you experienced this rise on the uh, you know, gender-based violence. I think that's an amazing thing because in Lithuania, before this uh, law, we have several hundred calls to police on domestic violence. It was such a family issue. Don't bring anything bad from home. And now we have 
each year more than 55,000 calls to police on domestic violence and it's rising and rising. From our perspective, it means that people are trusting the institutions and as our Icelandic sisters are saying all the time, if there are specialized services, there will be victims that are calling, you know, and using these services. And common just conc uh, several conclusions, I think that, uh, you know, I'm really all for trauma-informed care and victim-centered approaches. And I really want to highlight taking care of activists uh, that also experience activists of GBV globally. They are 24-7 activists. They've been doing this work for 10, 20, something 50 plus years. They too experience high level of gender-based violence. They too experience hate speech towards them from different governments, different institutions, media, public, you name it, we have it. And um, a constant this fatigue, you know? So this global cooperation, what we are doing uh, today I think is the best way to tackle it. Similar problems, we have different initiatives, so we don't want to reinvent the bike. If you have something that you can share, you share with us, we share with you and we go from there. So if you here in my contacts, you can find me on LinkedIn, would be happy to cooperate uh, with, uh, with you all on sexual violence or other forms of, uh, of GBV. And uh, this is my capital city, Vilnius, where I was born in. So you can visit whereisvilnius.com and uh, definitely maybe be inspired an option visiting uh, us in Vilnius. We would be happy to show you around or do some joint initiatives. So thank you for your time and back to you, Professor Diana. Thank you so much, Gail. It is really impressive, the work that's being done. And I appreciate your closing with an opportunity for others to join. We do exist um, at a, in a transnational space. Um, for many of us, we do know that there are many, that there's a, a digital divide, which affects women and girls in particular. But for those of us who are connected, we see that there are um, solutions developing in different spaces that could be adapted and, and, and um, implemented um, in, in around the world. So that, that call for collaboration and solidarity is, is welcome. We have many questions and comments that have been put both in the chat and the Q&A box. I'd like to begin by inviting those who have posed the questions to, to, to air your questions live. Is that, I believe that's a possibility, isn't it? If not, I can read four or so and we can take two sets of questions. Uh, do we have the capabilities here for the audience to open their mics and share their questions and comments? Yes, we do, Prof. Uh, they just need to use the raise hand function and I will allow them the opportunity to speak. Wonderful. So let's give um, this opportunity a minute and uh, see if anyone comes forward. Okay, wonderful. Please, um, Bella, Bella and I'm um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing names. And then Atola, Atola, let's take four and then we'll open it up to the panelists. Hey, thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you to all the panels for very interesting positive, positive presentations, I think, of not just the issues, but what solutions are being implemented to sort of deal with these issues. I think what I got from the presenters is mainly the idea that with gender-based violence, we need to look more specifically into particular victims that share unique circumstances and unique um, situations that drive particular factors of gender-based violence and abuse towards them. So my question to the panelists and whoever would like to answer is what measures in your own regions are governments implementing to address specific um, abuse? Specifically, I would like to ask about financial abuse. In South Africa, we're seeing a rise of men perhaps misrepresenting financial re responsibility and income, leaving the responsibility of child um care to women, but that's very difficult to address because it's a very specific form of abuse and sometimes isn't um, described or um, um, catered for by the law. So I would like to know what is your, your government, are they recognizing this? Are there specific forms of abuse that the constitution protects? And is there a way to sort of 
find these cases and deal with them, um, especially if they're not ex as explicit as physical abuse. Thank you so much. Thank you for that question. And I would like to invite the first, uh, all, all of the first three panelists to turn on their cameras and to engage um, in the discussion. And I, can maybe the, I can maybe then a great question. Thank you for that question. We actually been working with that uh, all almost all last year. So in Lithuania, uh, specialized, uh, uh, we have the specialized law against violence in private area and all forms of violence are included. So, for example, uh, economical violence as well. Also in the Ministry of Social Affairs and Labor, uh, we have this initiative of researching the phenomenon of economical violence, because as, uh, um, as you mentioned, there are a lot of layers of how to recognize economical, economical violence. So uh, definitely Definitely more research and the law. Also, we have it in the law that economical violence uh, uh, should not be uh, should not be in place. Uh, we do have some legal uh, legal problems uh, with the, with that, you know, because you can start pre trial investigation, but then you need some proofs, etc. And uh, what we have in Lithuania, for example, if an abusive husband uh, is fleeing somewhere and leaves you with a bunch of uh, with a bunch of children, then you can go to court and ask for alimony, you know, to support your children. And if uh, he or she is no, the perpetrator is nowhere to be uh, to be seen, then the state uh, gives you uh, an amount of money that, you know, on behind of him and then uh, go, go going uh, going after after him. But I think the question was uh, very important also because, uh, yeah, we do we are looking in more deep, what is economical violence? So how can we track it? How can we uh, prosecute it and et cetera? Thank you so much. And before we open it up for others to respond to the issue of economic violence, let's take um, three more questions and then the panelists can respond to whichever question um, uh, resonates with them. We have a question from Adatola, from Nola Wandel and Akira. Adatola. Uh, right, uh, thank you, Diana. Um, I have uh, three points. Um, for, first of it is uh, to on, on the issue about gender-based violence. Uh, how do we collect the statistics? Because it would appear that um, men are equally abused nowadays, and it, 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 there isn't anyone collecting the statistics on that. Uh, my second point would be on how do we determine uh, what you know who is worthy amongst prostitutes, and isn't you know acting against prostitution itself promoting inequality? Um, again, as well, on, on children abusing children, uh, shouldn't the focus be more on the dynamics of violence within dysfunctional families and family groupings? And when I say family groupings, people tend to, within poorer uh, uh, societies, people tend to live in family groupings and you tend to have um, uh, that closeness breeds as a breeding ground uh, for what we call uh, children abusing children type of violence. Uh, should we then not create a common platform for inclusive conversation so that we are not really really necessarily concentrating as if only women or only girls suffer this violence, but that violence itself could be more of an economic issue and you know uh, and, and begin to look at it uh, more from that point of view than from a gender lens exclusive uh, exclusively. Well, thank you for that provocative question. Let's take. Uh, a question now from, uh, I, I think, a a a Kola, Akira is next. Um, yes, thank you so much, um, everyone. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, my question is in, in relation to children abusing children um, in terms of sexual violence. Uh, when is it the right age to address uh, the issue of consent to children? I just posted uh, a, a link to an article that uh, states that a 15-year-old uh, in South Africa has raped eight children. And I've read more articles on even younger children raping other children. So I'm interested in the issue of consent and when would it be the right time to address it to children? And how can we then uh, have continuous conversations with children in safe spaces, um, especially in schools, to help uh, promote 
uh, the issue of consent in general. And I think also I want to look at sexual uh, violence as a GB, uh, B, GBV issue because um, mainly the perpetrators, it's always gender related where uh, a boy either rapes a, a young girl or um, uh, an older girl rapes a young boy. So I think it's very, um, there's, in, it's interlinked and interconnected. Uh, um, and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for that. Let's take one more, then we'll give an opportunity for responses. And then hopefully we'll have time for one more quick round before the second um, set of speakers. Um, let's see, who has not spoken? Um, Nolanda and Adetola, then we'll pause for responses. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, afternoon. I, I think, um, it's more of a comment really that I have it's um because in 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 I, i'm i'm going to speak in, in in about south africa because that's what i know the most not all the the gbv in this country we have to agree is frighteningly very high the levels of and uh it's it's uh, for me i feel that our approach shouldn't be just linear we report to the police and then the police may or may not do something. I, I, I think there are structures within our communities that should be empowered to be able to deal with preventative measures. I mean, uh, the speaker before spoke about children uh, sexually assaulting other children. And, uh, and that to me seems like a, a, an issue that communities should be able to prevent by having structures within community. Uh, it's just I haven't read the report from the presidential summit on GBV last year. Uh, that I mean, in, 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 in rural communities, for example, I grew up in a rural community in South Africa, and uh, some of those people are distrustful. People my age, people who grew up under apartheid, we may very well be distrustful of the police. Will they help? And in this case of GBV, I actually do feel that the distrust is warranted because women are not treated the way they should be when they go to a police station uh, to report a case of GBV. So what I'm trying to think is we shouldn't just think of, yes, law enforcement. Uh, we should think preventative measures within communities. Uh, my mother used to say, um, what happened to the women who will, walk, who will go to, to, to close down taverns because men were drinking away their salaries and then coming home and abusing women. So women just decided that the taverns were the problem. They closed them down. It worked for them then. That was in the 50s. But uh, it's 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 uh, for me. It's just somebody also spoke about about, for example, uh, uh, GBV against uh, sexual workers, sex workers. Uh, it's 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 a, a huge problem, but maybe we should. Uh, what do they say? How do you eat a, 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 an elephant one piece at a time? So I think it should start at communal level. What we do with our, with GBV? What what what? How do we prevent it? And and uh, government, it shouldn't be a top down approach. Yes, there are laws of the country that have to be. If there's a crime that's been committed, it has to be reported. But there also, I think, should be if, for rape, for example, there are uh, what are they called? Tutuzela centers. I don't know if they work for GBV as well. But uh, I know that Tutuzela centers are found in most government hospitals in South Africa. So it, it, there is something being done, but let, I, I feel that with, with more research and more support for government, it shouldn't just be a, a law enforcement issue. Thank you. Thank you very much for emphasizing the importance of existing community structures. Um, unfortunately, due to time, we're going to have to stop with the, the questions here. And I encourage those who still have questions and who have already put their questions to add them to the chat and for the, for the panelists to respond in the Q&A. Sorry, the Q&A, not the chat. 
um, where there's an opportunity to write in the responses. For now, we have a, a, a few minutes to respond to some of the questions, and I'd like to invite all the speakers to, to, to respond. We have a question about economic violence, about the abuse of men, um, and the stigma uh, around men's reporting. We have a question about children abusing other children, um, a, a, a question about a, a common platform for inclusive address of these problems. Is gender a limiting variable? And finally, drawing on existing structures in the communities. So if any of the panelists would like to respond briefly to any of these, we have just a few minutes. Uh, I can start uh, just briefly. Uh, I wrote uh, down, there's a lot of questions, which is great. I love when people have questions. So uh, is gender an important variable? Absolutely, yes, yes, and yes, because in Lithuania, we saw that if you talk about families or communities in, in general, women are almost always lost. So gender is a very important variable. Um, about uh, men and statistics, in Lithuania, when we collect statistics on GBV, and especially domestic violence, uh, we collect statistics from everyone in Lithuania. So we have, uh, lately we had 80 researchers that were trained and they collected statistics. So we do have statistics on men, victims of, uh, of uh, domestic violence, so one in five men in Lithuania. If you want to know more about abuse uh, against men, there is a wonderful organization in US called One in Six, and they're working a lot on sexual violence against men. And we are from time to time have the collaborations uh, on community engagement and police. In Lithuania, actually, it was a bottom up approach because community and non-governmental organizations push for the specialized law and then really try to work with the police officers. And I think that our connection now is actually pretty great, but after we it took us 10 years, but it's now pretty, uh, pretty great. And uh, finally, about consent age, wonderful question and uh, sexual violence uh, among children, wonderful question. So whenever a child starts to like stand on he or she or the, their feet, we can talk with them about boundaries. We first start by them knowing the true names of their genitals, not calling them some kind of weird names, son, whatever, call them by their medical names because we do have research that perpetrators that uh, talk with children that know their genitals actually you know, stay away from them more. So start very early on. Of course, with age appropriate language, but start as early as possible. 15 is already, they know a lot. They need to also programming, but it's different. Let's start as young as possible in the kindergarten. We start there. Thank you, thank you, Agail. Let's give Emily a chance and then we'll have to move on to our next set of speakers. Well, um, uh, thank you very much for all the questions. We actually just um, uh, appreciate some of the comments and questions that are coming from you listeners. Uh, just to add to what um, uh, what has been said, I, I know that when it comes to gender statistics, usually it's open, the data that's collected is for both men and women. But I think in the case of Nigeria, usually a problem or a challenge that usually would say uh, confront, confront people is how many people, how many men are actually willing to report cases of abuses? So now that's an issue because the way it is seen in the culture is if a man comes out to say he's been abused, then we're looking at it as he's a weak man. So those are some of the issues. Are they actually coming out to report the cases in on the side of men? But do they have the avenue to come out? Are there are there, are there data for it? Like for example, in Lagos State, we had some increase in the number of men coming out to report cases of uh, abuses from home and you know emotional physical violence. So there's data for it. But are they coming? Now do we have enough? That's another issue that you know we could also uh, talk about. And I totally agree on the issue of community um, responses because I will also say that the top-down uh, measures that are being used by the government probably at this level are not enough, especially when we have issues of cultural uh, um, um, cultural issues from countries like Nigeria. Um, 
the, the people most of the time do not come out. Even women, so even if we're talking about, there, there's a lot of abuses everywhere. It's everywhere and it's increasing. But are people coming out? How is the same culturally and religion as well? play a, a massive uh, part when it comes to collecting this data. But I know that um, uh, there's a lot to be done. And the good thing is awareness is coming out. People are talking about it now. We are not where we were before when people were keeping silent. We're talking about it. Government is doing advocacy. Uh, CSOs and NGOs are doing a lot of advocacy. So with research, I'm sure um, some improvement can be seen over time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, both of you, and uh, for, uh, for the audience for your important reflections and questions. Now we have to move next to our second panel of speakers and uh, our moderator for that, Dr. Tinuad Ojo. Over to you, Tinuad. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, um, Professor Diana. That was quite an informative session and thank you so much to our whole uh, three panelists um yeah it's it was quite intriguing i had my own set of questions but we'll take it up later on um so without further ado i'm still in the heart of uh, the conversation please we'll urge the participants to please send their questions to the q and a session uh, so that we take note of that um, I'm going to be ushering in Dr. Shazia Malik. Um, Dr. Shazia teaches postgraduate gender studies at the Center for Women's Studies and Research at the University of Kashmir and served as coordinator of the center from May 2022 to November 2022. Dr. Shazia has managed the academic issues of the center as an academic counselor since 2017 and worked as a research officer at the Jamun and Kashmir State Resource Center for Women. Um, the National Mission for Empowerment for Women, she has also worked for Government of India and other Institute. Dr. Malik um, holds a PhD in Women's Studies from the Distinguished Advanced Center for Women's Studies, Aliyah Muslim University. Our research is focused on the intricate um, dynamics of gender and advancing comprehensive understanding of the consequences of violence on women's development and across genders. Um, she's actually the author of Women's Development Amid Conflict in Kashmir, a Social Cultural Study. Dr. Shazia, over to you quickly. You're muted, Shazia. You're muted. We can't hear you. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Am I audible now? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. Thank, um, thank you so much, uh, Dinod, for this uh, wonderful introduction. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to participate uh, in this panel. And thank you, Diana, uh, as usual, for, uh, I assume, you recommended my name. Uh, uh, and. It's, it's great to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, uh, we had wonderful presentations before this. So uh, now uh, I will um, talk about some complex dynamics of gender-based violence in uh, the scenic but conflict-ridden region of Kashmir with a focus on resolving uh, the new patriarchies and their profound impact on the lives of Kashmiri women. Uh, before uh, exploring these complexities, uh, it is crucial to understand the broader context of Kashmir. Settled amid uh, the majestic Himalayas, this, um, this region has been entrapped in a prolonged conflict marked by political turmoil, territorial disputes, armed insurgency for several decades that has resulted in a heavy presence of security forces. So amid this conflict, Kashmiri women have played pivotal roles, not only as caregivers and nurturers, but also as activists and agents of change. 
However, alongside their activism, we cannot ignore the emergence of what can be termed as new patriarchy in Kashmir. So a resurgence of patriarchal norms and practices that has emerged in recent years, worsening the plight of Kashmiri women. This insidious phenomenon perpetuates violence and reinforces traditional gender norms, restricting women's freedom and autonomy, particularly in public spaces. So this phenomenon is deeply intertwined with complexities of conflict and exacerbating the challenges uh, faced by Kashmiri women. So to demonstrate the harsh realities and challenges faced by uh, Kashmiri women under the grip of these new patriarchies, let's examine some disturbing incidents that serve as grim reminders of uh, the urgent need for change. So these incidents that uh, I'm going to uh, examine uh, with you uh, have been carefully chosen as they appear to represent an unsettling new pattern that is emerging in Kashmir. One where women are facing escalated violence and backlash for attempt attempting to claim public spaces and roles that defy traditional patriarchal norms. So such uh, covert targeting of women's public expression and freedom was less commonplace in the past. However, these cases illustrate how certain regressive forces are now employing harsh tactics to reinforce the subjugation of women and restrict their visibility and voices in the public domain. So in 2012, for example, an all-female rock band named Pragash faced severe backlash and threats of violence from conservative elements in Kashmiri society. So these, despite their passion for music and dreams of cultural expression, they were forced to disband after receiving threats of rape and death on social media, highlighting the extreme measures taken to silence women who defy traditional norms. In 2023, very recently, a young woman met a horrifying and when uh, you know uh, uh, when she rejected a marriage proposal from an acquaintance her mutilated beheaded remains were discovered uh, uh, which is a grim testament to the brutal consequences of suborning male advances her case epitomizes the toxic masculinity and patriarchal control that is prevalent in region where women's bodies become battlegrounds for male dominance. Recently, a budding actress and social media personality was gunned down outside her home, highlighting the risks faced by outspoken women who challenge traditional gender roles. Back in 2018, a woman who, in, who was involved in a notorious sex scandal faced a relentless public scrutiny and ostracization. Accused of running a prostitution racket, she attempted to expose scandals of powerful patrons, which included politicians, bureaucrats, and police officials mainly, through her memoir. However, her efforts were met with suspicion and indifference, leading to her mysterious demise. An innocent child's brutal rape and murder, popular as Asifa's case, allegedly orchestrated to stoke communal tensions, epitomizing the intersection of patriarchy with conflict, communalism, and regional politics in Kashmir. So the subsequent attempts to shield the perpetrators and politicize her case expose deep-seated systemic failures in addressing gender-based violence. In India, the photographs of numerous Muslim women, including journalists and the activists, were displayed on an uh, on two apps. One was called a bully buy and the other was called a sully deals. These were uh, apps that uh, uh, were made to, for fake online auction of these Muslim women, subjecting them to dehumanization and uh, objectification. So the list of these selected Muslim women included Kashmiri female journalists known for raising voice against unjust. So this incident highlights how religious identities also intersect with patriarchal attitudes to perpetuate gender-based violence and 
the objectification of Kashmiri Muslim women. So in confronting these new patriarchies that manifest through religious hatred, misogyny, attempts to dehumanize and object objectify women, we must recognize the urgent need for comprehensive strategies. So these strategies must address the root causes of gender-based violence. Uh, uh, the, these must promote religious tolerance and social cohesion and foster inclusive governance. The struggles faced by Kashmiri women emphasize the urgent need for policy measures to address gender-based violence hate uh, crimes motivated by religious bigotry and the concerted efforts to silence and subjugate women's voices. Resolving uh, the complex conflicts in Kashmir requires inclusive dialogue, compassionate diplomacy, and ensuring women's perspectives across religious lines, uh, they're uh, you know, integrated into decision-making uh, processes. So only then can the vicious cycles of violence and hatred be broken empowering kashmiri women to uh, to reclaim their safety dignity and agency in a region that is currently marked by conflict oppression and prejudice so we must remain uh, and this is an appeal to all the panelists is to remain unwavering in our commitment to end all forms of gender based violence and religious uh, persecution plaguing the women of kashmir thank you all for joining me in this important discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shazia, and thank you for keeping to time. That's amazing. <laughs> um, it's quite interesting to hear what is going on um, also in the Hindian community. Just as we've said, um, this is actually a shared norm um, that is quite global. Um, before we go into the QA session, we'll bring in our last speaker for today, uh, Dr. Dalia Bin. Um, Dr. Dalia Bean is a senior lecturer and graduate coordinator at the Institute of Gender and Development Studies Regional Coordinating Office at the University of West Indies in Jamaica. She has researched extensively in the areas of gender in conflict situations and women and gender in Caribbean history, including um, having two books and over 20 book chapters and journal articles. Wow, that's amazing, Dr. Dalia. Our first single authored book, A Jamaican Woman, and the world was on the front lines of change was published in 2017 by Paul Grave Macmillan. And she's working with Professor Varen Shepard on the co-edited collection on gender-based violence in the Caribbean, historical roots, contemporary continuities, which is expected to be published by the UWI Press in 2024. Well done, Dr. Dahlia. Over to you, Dr. Dahlia. Thank, Thank you so much, Dr. Tina. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it's great to be here with so many esteemed colleagues from around the world. I've been really benefiting from the discussion so far. So let us jump in. Um, I will be speaking very quickly today on the topic past, present, and no futures, mapping GBV in the English-speaking Caribbean. Now, as I'm a historian, I um, will have to do just a brief retrospective to be able to situate the issue of gender-based violence as it is represented in our um, Caribbean region. And so this is why I'm starting with the past. So looking at her and histories very briefly. So in the region, in the Caribbean region, and particularly in the English-speaking Caribbean, we have a shared history of violence through the imposition of colonization and resistance to such efforts. I think sometimes when we think about the violence that has been um, curated in the region, it is not only about what was imposed on persons, but of course the resistance efforts that um, took place in terms of fighting against these structures. Now, importantly, while we're aware that enslaved people's realities were shaped by systemic violence and inequalities, a lot of the work that uh, myself and Professor Shepard and colleagues are doing through the work that Dr. Tinu just mentioned is looking at these historic um, lines and the ways in which 
per, we were made vulnerable to very gender specific abuses, enslavement and um, uh, forced other forced um, labor schemes and the way indigenous persons were treated were gender specific abuses. These were not gender blind or gender neutral. And so mapping that sort of history gives us a better opportunity to understand what is happening in our in our present and mapping futures where we, we do hope to have no um, more um, instances of this scourge of gendered violence. So power exalted over colonized peoples by enslavers was not only one for monetary gain and political status, but included unfettered rights, for instance, to um, of sexual access to women's bodies. Now, we have been speaking through the Q&A and so on about what, what, what's the situation with men. We are very, very well aware that women's bodies were um, the battlefield on which enslavement was raged, but also sexualized torture and sexualized abuse was meted out to enslaved men by enslavers in order to strip them of their masculinity undermine their and undermine their assumed sexual prowess. We have other layers of gendered violence in our history as well. So we have what is more common in terms of um, the, the male as perpetrator, woman as survivor victim, but we also have cases of women, all this kind of woman on woman gendered violence, where white women, for instance, themselves victims of intimate partner violence, exacted great cruelty to black and mixed race women constituting another layer of gendered violence rooted in jealousy and powerlessness to confront their own husbands. And we see a lot of these things continuing in our society today. Also with post-slavery labor schemes came more opportunities for abuse of immigrant women who were often caught between competing patriarchies of black and Indian men. And so this is how we have framed the past that we have now inherited when it, in terms of the gendered violence that we now see. Now, some of the work that I have been specifically working on as I'm a 20th century historian, that's my core area in terms of training, is that what I found interesting is that as we emerge into the 20th century, particularly looking at Jamaica, gender-based violence, intimate partner violence, and rape were shrouded in clouds of respectability and domesticity of women. So violence against women, though commonly featured in print media, and I've given you some examples here, when you look at our print media in the 1930s, 40s, there is no shortage of gendered violence. In fact, it was one of the things that made up our newspapers in, in, in great numbers. So articles, very graphic details of what was happening to women, women being beaten in the streets and so on, were very common in our print media. But what I found interesting is that while it is so obvious in the media, our leaders at that time, even social activists and even social workers and persons who were working for women's rights and black women's rights at that time were not publicly discussing the issue of gendered violence. So even up to the 1950s, this was shrouded in a sort of strange mixed place where it is quite obvious in the media, but not being dealt with as a social um, issue by leadership. And I think um, Professor Fox mentioned that um, in her opening remarks earlier, it wasn't until the 70s and 80s that it was actually taken up in legislative framework and in local, regional and international considerations. So what are some of the continuities when we move now from the past to the present? What is bridging the gap between what we have had, what we've inherited and created to an extent in our past and what is happening now? So in the region, we do have a culture of acceptance of violence. And I will jump even to the about fourth or fifth bullet point, where it's not just that violence is accepted as a natural part of, of life, but also discipline as love. And we have reports and research that is showing that exposure to violence in childhood, for instance, correlates greatly with experiencing and perpetuating intimate partner violence in adulthood. So we have a lot of persons in our region, a lot of women who believe that if a man does not beat her, he does not love her. And um, of course, disciplining of children through corporal punishment carries through many times into how we have relationships, um, interpersonal relationships later in life. We also have legacies of high rates of sexual violence. We have remnants of colonial um, social conditions that facilitate inequality and violence. 
economic violence, as has been discussed before, family violence, the attitude of male rule, even in spaces where we have like 45 to 50 percent women headed households in the region, there is still this understanding or expectation of male rule or patriarchy and, of course, unequal power relations. So stepping from the past now into the present, what is the prevalence of gendered violence in our region? On average in the region, at least one in three women is beaten, coerced, beaten, coerced into sex or otherwise abused in an intimate partner, by an intimate partner in the course of their lifetime. Women, unlike men, are more likely to be um, abused, not by a stranger, but by someone they know. So when you look at the data that we have, we find that men tend to um, face violence from strangers, and it is more likely for a woman to be um, facing violence from someone in, someone they know. And so the home, which of course should be a place of love and solace, is in fact one of the main risk factors for for women in the region. And I wanted to stress, which is why I've made it a little bigger here, the importance, sometimes we for, forget this aspect too, of fear of assault. And so a, UND, a recent UNDP um, Caribbean Human Development Report indicates that 30.4% of women in the Caribbean, and I believe it's much higher than this, um, report high rates of fear of sexual assault. And this goes to, goes to the issue of rape culture. This goes to the issue of victim blaming. This goes to the issue of women um, being um, additionally vulnerable, not only to acts of violence, but the fear of violence. Um, just by being a woman, you have a heightened fear of what could happen to you as a result of that. Now, I did say I'd be looking at the English-speaking Caribbean, and I wanted to show some um, cases or, or give some snapshot of what is happening in various spaces. And so I wanted to very briefly look at the cases of Guyana and Grenada in terms of what are risk factors in these specific spaces for intimate partner violence in particular. So we see um, the, the link, I will, well, the link is here in the PowerPoint, and so you will be able to access it, or I could put it in the chat. This is a really wonderful um, resource, Caribbean Women Count by UN Women, which gives data across the region and it's um, updated from time to time and specifically looks at comparing risk factors in five countries. I'm just looking at two at the moment. So for instance, in Ghana, um, one of the major risk factors is where the partner has an extramarital relationship. This is usually one of the major causes of in intimate partner violence. And we see that that is similar for Grenada. Also in Guyana, where the partner is controlling, again, speaking to issues of patriarchy, power and control and unequal power relations within that relationship. Um, in Guyana, researchers also found that when the partner has been in a fight with another man, particularly recently, like in the day or the day before or in the week, um, that tends to spill over into the, the intimate partner space and is a risk factor as well. Um, and also, importantly, where the woman is the main source of income. And this speaks to the issue of men feeling threatened. This speaks to the issue of jealousy. And so even as we work towards, many of, of, of us in the region are working towards women's empowerment, what we have found is with that empowerment often comes these issues where women are at more risk. And so definitely having the conversations and interventions with men and boys is really, really critical to tackling these issues. Um, very quickly, when we look at this for Grenada, as I said, similar to Ghana, where the partners had an extramarital relationship, this also forms a risk factor. Women's educational levels, so the higher the educational level, the lower the chance of staying in a space of intimate partner violence. And we also have the similarity of where the partner is controlling. This is a risk factor, a high risk factor for intimate partner violence. Again, as I had said earlier, there is this link in the region between what we what it, we experience as children and of course what's happening in adulthood. So in Grenada, it was found that women who were exposed to emotional abuse during childhood were more likely to be at risk for intimate partner violence in adulthood.
Now, an important thing that we're dealing with today is vulnerabilities. And there are numerous layers of intersections of vulnerabilities. I just wanted in the very short time to, to, to look at two. So in the Caribbean, for instance, there are over 1 million persons living with some form of a disability. And these persons face multiple challenges for accessing education, um, for in, um, navigating the environment, and of course, language and communication barriers. This not only makes persons with disabilities more vulnerable to GBV, but also less likely to benefit from social services relating to their mitigation. It's not that we don't have the social services, but then these persons are less likely to benefit from it. And I would really like to just pause here to congratulate um, our Institute for Gender and Development Studies and our um, research fellow, Natasha, Morley, Dr. Natasha Morley, who I know is on the call, um, who just led a project in which we were reviewing the Domestic and Sexual Harassment Act in Jamaica, and from that, and one of the knowledge products is in Braille. And so um, blind women and men, of course, will be able to interact with their legislation a lot easier because of this output. So persons living with disabilities have an added layer of vulnerability in the region, and of course, persons in the LGBTQI community. And a recent report um, looking at the Eastern Caribbean found that these persons are vulnerable to abuse, which starts in the home and continues with macro and micro aggressions and are undergirded by social and legal structures, such as the church and law enforcement. And just moving towards the end, um, I also wanted to very briefly touch on the issue of the economic cost, because what we're now seeing is that when we convince our governments that GBV costs more than it should, then this also is a way in which to work on changing these um, situations. And so just very quickly to note that in Jamaica, for the case of Jamaica, the total cost of violence against women in 2018 was more than US $1 billion, which represents almost 7% of our GDP. This is a very scary number to be spending on something we can mitigate. And so to close, what do I mean by no futures? Um, I do remain motivated um, and uh, proud of the work that many of our activist organizations have done or academic organizations have done across the region. Very important that have been doing work before Feminism was a word <laughs> or, or an understood concept in global spaces. Red Thread Guyana, um, Transwave um, in Jamaica recently, WMW, our own IGDS, and of course, undergirded by the um, regional and international structures such as CEDAW, such as um, SDG5, and of course, funded in part by um, initiatives such as the Spotlight Initiative and others. But just really to say that while we have a chronic issue, we are not daunted and believe that we do have the possibility of futures um, without gender-based violence. And I'm happy to discuss some of these more in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dahlia. Um, and thank you for keeping to time. Uh, I know how hard that was. <laughs> thank you so much for such an informative um, session. I've really engaged with your institute and quite in awe of um, that 30 years of advocacy and activism that um, the Institute of Gender and Development uh, Studies in University of West Indies have done and even contributed to the Caribbean region as a whole. Um, so thank you very much to you and your colleagues for the continued work. Um, some people have asked me that, yeah, this, this should be, there should be more of these um, dialogues. And yes, um, this is quite an inclusive dialogue. We couldn't bring all the speakers um, today because of time frame. Um, so it's going to actually be in series. And um, just as Dan has indicated earlier on, we hope um, to actually bring forth um, a published book out of this, um, out of this series, which we have actually embarked on. And I saw one of my colleagues also put in there um, the other book project on the sexual health and uh, reproduction, which um, we're actually doing with uh, Dr. Natasha that Dr. Dalia just mentioned. So yeah, there's a lot of um, uh, themes to work on and uh, uh, themes which has actually matched from today. So because of time, we're about to end. Um, I'll just take two questions and um, 
if anyone has a question, just two, the first two, I will take it. Others, please type it out. I will encourage all the panelists for today um, to please read um, the comments that have been said in the chat so that you can actually comment on that as we um, give you a chance to give um, the last minute comment. And then we bring this conversation, this dialogue to a close. So um, do we have anybody? Any hands? I see Aditola. Um, yes, you can ask your question, Aditola. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Joe. I th you have um, actually responded to one. Uh, the other bit that is important for me, and that's to do with the last speaker, is that I was just wondering, would breaking down gender arc itself, you know, by uh, looking at a more egalitarian uh, society, stop violence, given that most of the reasons, whether you trace it from slavery, uh, you know, to current uh, free uh, labor, uh, is necessarily going to stop it, given that a lot of it has to do more with econo economic um, exploitation and ownership. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Prof. Diana? Hi there, thank you. Um, I would love if, if we have time for Dr. Shazia to speak about the ways in which Kashmiri women are working at the grassroots level to address religious oriented gender-based violence and uh, Dr. Delia to share some examples of how you're incorporating historical framing of the roots of gender-based violence in programs to eradicate it. Okay, thank you so much. So I'll give the uh, last two panelists a chance to talk first, and then we'll invite um, the first panelist um, with um, the first panelist in the first session to also give a last minute comment, and then we bring it to a close. So um, let's start with Dr. Shazia, and then Dr. Dalia can come in. Dr. Shazia. Uh, sorry, I uh, I was kind of lost uh, because my daughter was crying. Uh, could you uh, repeat, Dinah? Uh, yes, yes, sure, Shazia. I'm curious about how um, women in Kashmir are organizing at the grassroots or speaking together at the grassroots to disrupt religious-based, gender-based violence. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are not... Uh, women's organizations are broadly missing. Uh, in Kashmir. So uh, earlier, uh, there were like um, few women's organizations, uh, but uh, those women's organizations used to be influential, but they also used to be politically connected. So there was always uh, some kind of nuance there, uh, whether, you know, uh, the common women would feel uh, connected to them or not. So, but yes, uh, they they. Uh, was some kind of connection with them but uh, since last many years uh, the women's grassroots level women's organizations have completely disappeared and that's a major problem right now we are facing uh, even uh, when me too movement happened so there was a there was one organization which was a muslim women organization and uh, educated and influential uh, women uh, being part of it. So they took uh, women's voices to social media. Uh, it was unlike, uh, you know, other states in uh, and uh, countries in the world uh, that um, women didn't voice their uh, concerns uh, on social media directly in, in their put, uh, in their media handles. Uh, but it was through that organizations uh, organization that they did it. So uh, they became the voice of uh, women in Me Too movement. But uh, that also uh, was short-lived. And uh, though it gave some hopes, but uh, in a year or two, it, it also collapsed. So in a conflict situation like this, when uh, you know there are many, many intersections uh, which bind people in uh, different, you know, things. So it, it it becomes difficult for the organizations also in the first place to survive. So um, my concern here is that women, common women, marginalized women are deeply uh, affected by uh, these intersections and there is nobody to help, like the government, the 
you know the organizations private even though there is a one mushroom more NGO yeah. there. yes <laughs> One more minute. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there is a mushrooming of NGOs right now. like, And this happens in any conflict region that uh, there are many agencies who want to invest in welfare uh, schemes and other things, but not directly on you know gender-based violence. So that's Thank all. you so much for that. Um, Dr. Dahlia, your response quickly. Yes. Um, to the former question, I, I do think that the, the work, um, much of the work that's been um, spoken about here, which um, does get to the root of inequalities, is part of the, the um, measure. I mean, most of our societies have violence deeply embedded in, in the fabric of the culture. It's, you know, the acceptance of violence as a way we express ourselves. So it's not only inequalities, it's also this acceptance of violence <clears throat> as normative <clears throat> and even admirable in some cases. So, but definitely I think, you know, the advocacy work that that really works on, on tearing down inequalities and allowing um, persons to live in more egalitarian um, societies, communities and families definitely is part of that. Uh, and then just very quickly in terms of how I personally use a historic framing in contemporary work, uh, so I do that as part of my academic journey, but in advocacy work, what I do find is that when we are training persons in communities or organizations about gendered violence, and we're able to give them that historic framing of where we're coming from, it allows them to see the violence that we're now experiencing and perpetrating as having a root. And when you understand the root, then you're better able to uproot and change norms and customs and traditions that you believe are factual and fixed and um, unchangeable. And, it, and, and so getting back to those roots and getting back to an understanding of where we're coming from, it does help persons and participants in, in terms of advocacy um, to change their view of something that they believe is fixed and unchangeable. So that is one of the ways that um, just very briefly, you know, not more time is left for that. But but definitely I find, um, I mean, I am a historian, so I ha always have to look back. But bringing that into workshops and seminars is really, it, it gets people, it gives people that light bulb moment, which is really what we want to change minds and to change hearts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, one word, Dr. Um, Rugile. <laughs> I'm turning you to a doctor today. Rugile? <laughs> thank, thank you. It's it's great. I will put it on my resume. Yeah. So I, I just I just wanna uh, I just wanna you know uh, leave everyone with that. I'm so inspired by all the women leaders that uh, spoke today, and I think by joining all together, it's really like uh, so therapeutic almost to hear that we have similar struggles and also stamina stamina to fight for that. And I do believe that. Uh, Maybe it will sound a little bit controversial, but uh, I believe that if women, women like like this would rule the world, we would have less war, less GBV and more safety in our community. So thank you so much for organizing. It was an amazing event. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Dr. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone and all the listeners. It's been an interesting um, session for me and, and then an eye-opening, just getting to hear some of the issues that we also have across our region. So for me, I think uh, a take-home is really something that hit me. It's, let's look at the communal uh, aspect of it, you know, instead of just looking at government and government, there's a lot that has to be done at the community level because uh, the issue of gender-based violence is, is, be, is, is more than what we actually are looking at. It's, it's violence against the girl child, it's violence against the boy child, it's violence against men, it's violence against uh, women. And we all have to work together to ensure that the society that we live in is peaceful and we all can live freely and be who we want to be. Thank you all once again as we continue the conversation uh, next time. Thank you, um, Tina. 
Thank you so much, everyone, that, you know, we cannot really finish this. Um, we've spoken about different approaches, different dimensions um, to gender-based violence today, um, which actually need to be researched. Hopefully, um, through our collaboration, we'll be able to secure funding and do bigger projects in all these our communities and, you know, be able to gather that data that we are talking about, the statistics, so that um, we stop using assumptive data for gender, but we are actually able to contribute to the real facts, um, which can actually influence policy um, in all the uh, policy levels. Um, so thank you, everyone. It's been amazing. I have a lot to say, but no, uh, we have to close. Uh, so I will be bringing in um, Diana to, to um, end the session. I will let you know about the next series of this uh, conversation and as we bring in more speakers um, who are also part of this project. Thank you, everybody. Diana, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ojo, um, Professor Ojo and team. Um, I would like to offer a, a vote of thanks and close first with just a few words. We leave today with insights into common problems, specific situations, and a rich array of ideas for deepening understanding and directing our programs of action. All levels of change are significant and must be simultaneously implemented from community interventions to international and national frameworks. It is easy to get overwhelmed. So many problems are entrenched. New ones are arising in response to emerging conditions. But as we heard today, approaches of care, solidarities through transnational community building and deepening community support at grassroots levels are all significant. Knowing where change has been is, is significant to encourage us uh, for further change, it is happening and we have to take that into account. Now I would like to thank the projects team at the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversations, Ms. Nampu Melelo Dawande, Ms. Ratizo Makombe, the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the University of the West Indies, the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversation at the University of Johannesburg, the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Johannesburg, the Embassy of the Republic of Lithuania to the Republic of South Africa, the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies, to all panelists, all audience, thank you so much for being here with us today. We hope you take away the important insights from the panel and looking forward to further interactions. All the very best. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.